Welcome back. We have returned to the Nexus. There was a lot of beautiful music in the realm of Priam. Some of my favorite tracks in the game, along with locations. And I wanted to take a moment to tell a little story about this game's music. This is such an utterly inspiring score for me. I've complimented the composer numerous times in this playthrough alone. But I loved it so much that uh, some years ago it occurred to me to see if this guy could be written to so I could compliment him directly and maybe ask him for advice because I was working on a major score of my own. So I found him online. You know, composers tend to have websites, and I uh, wrote him. His name is Eric Heberling, and I've never known if that was the correct pronunciation. And I wrote him an email, and it reads as follows. Subject, thank you. Eric, hi, total stranger here. I just wanted to thank you for your work and let you know how much you've influenced me. Doug, you know what I'm talking about, right? I don't know if you ever had the whole, heard the whole letter I wrote him. Anyway, I'll continue. My first girlfriend introduced me to Deathgate when I was 15. I loved everything about the game. I'd already supplemented my ear training heavily by playing the video game music I enjoyed while growing up. The main theme of Deathgate became one of those pieces. But that entire score really stood out to me. I think it was the first score that struck me as having been composed for a real orchestra while being realized through early synth instruments. While I've developed my compositional approach over the years, that score is one thing I've constantly referred back to. I also have the tradition of naming my iPods after video game composers that have stood out for me. Heberling is the name of my current one. I'm just now working on my first full video game score for Lars Simkin's recent successful Kickstarter startup, Frontiers. Lars' vision was heavily influenced by the Elder Scrolls series, particularly Daggerfall. So I'd been watching some walkthroughs of that. Just this morning, I started to notice the harp glissandos, like the one that just went by, and that whole major minor third thing in the tonic chord, like that you hear in the opening theme in the first minute or the first moments. And it finally hit me to wonder whether that could possibly have been Eric Heberling. Sure enough. Um, what I meant by that is, yeah, I was listening to Daggerfall's score and I recognized the composer by the similar styles. Anyway, Frontiers is just my first game score, but I hope I can find more opportunities of that kind in the future. If you have any advice for me, I'll certainly listen carefully. Thank you and best wishes. Steve Barnes. Anyway, I really didn't expect any kind of a response, but I did get a brief one. Uh, looks like I got it. I wonder how many days it took. Um, I'm not sure if I can tell. Anyway. Oh, no, I can tell. It was, it looks like it took him two thirds of a month or so. He wrote back and said, Steve Thunks, THNX, for your message. Got a good laugh out of the iPod thing. Good luck with the Frontiers score. And always give each project your best effort. Eric. <laughs> So, you know, I kind of like that the advice was so simple. I think I've always borne that advice in mind. I have always given each project my best effort. Certainly each video game music project, because that is one of my very highest callings as I perceive it. I mean, the, one of the kinds of tasks that in my mind is most deserving of one's best effort. Anyway, back at the Nexus, Haplo has been patiently waiting, but this ship is a great place to wait. Isn't it cool to hang out in? Look at it. If it feels as tranquil as this music makes it feel, I could spend hours in here, I'm sure. Now, we don't have a book or anything on any of the other realms. We found a whole book about Priyan, fortunately. Uh, but we do have the stone. Zifnab's stone is unremarkable in shape. Somewhat rough, but without sharp edges. It's fairly ordinary in appearance, too. Some gift. A run-of-the-mill rock. Yeah. Looks like just a stone. Well, we have a boss to report to. That's not where we want to go. Ah, oh, there we go. Hey, Zar. 
Let's talk to him. You hand over the fire seal piece and quickly recount your experiences on Priam. Zar listens closely to your description of Ziftnab and the Titans, obviously troubled by both encounters. Excellent, my son. You exceed even my best expectations. Not only did you recover Priam's seal piece, but you have discovered a living Sartan. I doubt that he is alone, as he claims, and the addition of these titans to his forces means that he is someone to be reckoned with. I will have to adjust my plans to compensate. We might have to destroy this citadel to be sure of the giant's destruction. It is a shame you couldn't bring Ziphnab back with you for further questioning. Hmm. Well, yeah. He tends to suspect all Sartan, so that's understandable, and I do too, but Zifnab seemed... You know. You have the crystal fragment of the world seal. Use that to place the naming rune of Abarak upon your steering stone, and then leave as soon as you can. Events are occurring at a fast pace. If even one Sartan knows you exist, we must assume they all do. But we need information. I must know what the other realms are like, where the Sartan's forces are, and what they number. And I need those seal pieces. Good luck, my son. The Realm of Stone, yes. So we can ask him about the seeming discrepancies between his impressions and ours. Zifnab seemed mad, but he genuinely cared about the mensch there. He had a plan to make their lives better. Who knows how far gone that Sartan was. Living in solitude with those mench would have driven anyone insane. No wonder he was obsessed with them. Hopefully, when the world is reformed and we destroy the Citadel, he'll disappear along with it. Yeah, that is a take. Um, what about the dragon? What about Zifnab's dragon? Do you consider him a threat? <laughs> if I believed in him, I would. Don't take this personally, my son, but dragons are fairy tales, legends, nothing more. This Ziphnab played on your gullibility. I've read that the Sartan used to command the art of illusion. He must have created the dragon for your benefit, to keep you from killing him. It worked, didn't it? Yeah, hmm, okay, that's another explanation, it's possible. I mean, if it was an illusion and it was a good one, we would have seen it, right? If you destroy the Citadel, won't that kill the mench that have moved inside? Are you questioning my tactics? Don't you understand that the threat represented by the Titans far outweighs the importance of the lives of a few mench? Don't get personally involved with them, Haplo. This is war. There are always sacrifices. That's enough for right now. I'd like to talk to you later if you don't mind. Very well. I'll be here. Huh. Well, we don't have a long conversation this time. That was pretty straightforward, actually. I don't remember the spell of rune transfer. Let's look it up. That was just two pieces. That's kind of nice. Kind of nice. Alrighty, um, let's head out. You call on the power of the Steering Stone to take you through the Death Gate and into Abarak. World of Stone. Oh, and at the beginning of the break, Doug said that this was certainly the inspiration for Deep Space Nine, which I can't argue with. The loom says, Buddy is lying on the pillow beside me, happily watching over my shoulder. Hi, Buddy. Well, that took my attention. Your ship flies from the Death Gate into a river of lava. Walls of dark rock enclose you in a giant cavern so large that it actually houses a city carved from the stone. You dock the ship a small distance away. Hey, buddy. Let's try one more time. 
Zara knows nothing. At least the ship can withstand the lava, apparently. That's pretty good. Oh, there's the city. Look at it. Wow, it's so small compared to this cavern. And we can see, what, maybe another shore down here and maybe a statue of some kind over here? Some kind of an enclosure or a bay over there? Hmm. All right, I think we're going to save at this point. The two R's have a menacing quality in that word. All right. Who knows what we'll find the moment we step out of the ship. This world seems a bit more naturally hostile than the other two. Here we go. Your ship floats in a river of lava alongside a stone embankment. In the distance, you see a dark city. Two ways we can go. Fields. And city? Are those two different ways? Oh, no. One way is back into the ship. Well, let's look at the fields. It's hard to make out more than a blur of furrowed rows in the soil. You'll have to get closer to see it better. Okay, maybe the fields are on the way to the city. Yeah, it kind of looks like we have fields, tunnel, cave... And that goes through to the city. Okay. Let's go that way. Hello. Here a hulking figure shuffles from a dried up pond to a field. Long dead. Behind him a cave opens into the cavern wall. Beyond the lava river you see a city in the distance. Right. So the field is dead? A few struggling plants poke out of the ground. Furrowed rows in the thin dirt indicate that the field was once blanketed with the strange grass. However, many seasons have passed since the field has seen any life-giving water. Nectar of the gods. Graham can now feel strength and renewal flowing through him. Obligatory. Excuse me. All right. Oh. Is it the worker who is long dead? If so, how exactly... The hulking corpse just stares at you. Zar did say this place was horrible and the worst of the realms. He was right about that. Greetings. Who are you? Uh, who? Name Jeffro. What is this place? Uh, what? Place? Home. What are you doing? Uh, doing? Water. Plant. Uh, well, we could ask him to accompany us. That's a nice bucket. Would you give it to me? The corpse looks at the bucket for a moment and then silently hands it to you. All right. It's a zombie jamboree. It might well be. Yeah. Maybe Haplo thinks it's diplomatic, too. Would you accompany me? The corpse shuffles over beside you and looks at you expectantly. Well, hi, okay. You're, you're here now. Yeah, he can understand you. You're right. Age has rusted and ruined the once strong metal bucket, so that carrying water in it would be impossible. The dead worker's dull eyes roam around confused. All right. He disappeared. This shallow cave ends in an unnatural wall covered by carved dwarven symbols. A coiled snake studies you. 
Without any direction, the confused dead worker wanders off. Hi, Snake. Uh, yeah. Attack or pet? Two great options. Evil red eyes. This is true evil. Our rock isn't glowing, though, so that's not working. Evil red eyes glower at you. You can almost see its tiny brain trying to decide if you are food or a threat. Neither would be particularly advantageous to us. Either way, it doesn't seem to like you very much. I don't think I'm going to pet it. Sorry, Lexi. You take the rocks. Nice. Okay, can we look at the wall? The far wall of the cave is covered with nine identical carved dwarven symbols, right? I don't think we're going there, though. You try to sneak past the snake, but it's far too alert. It watches you with predatory eyes. Just waiting for you to come within striking distance. Back we go. The city. Ooh. A very clock-sounding kind of theme. You're surrounded by the stone buildings of the deserted town, including a clock tower to the east and an elegant residence to the north. Clock tower... House. Clock tower house. Let's check out the clock tower. We can go in. The base of the tower is unadorned. A ladder leads up, but it is broken. A rope hangs down within reach. Okay. Jethro is a busy man, and if you don't get to the point quickly, he goes right back to his beloved garden. Yeah. Can't blame him for that. There's a new sitcom I'm working on. It's called Look at the Hook. A metal hook is tied to the rope hanging down from the clock mechanism far above. Okay. Can we put some rocks in the pail? Put the pail on the hook? Does that work? Why would we do that? Okay. Maybe there's like a clock bell kind of mechanism, you know, clock tower mechanism, and you need a weight, counterweight. All right. And the hole isn't big enough for rocks. That's good. I don't think we're climbing this ladder. But we can try. This ladder's condition is contagious. How about that for phrasing? Anyone climbing it is liable to break something. Chances are it would be your neck. Especially if I was the one climbing it. This is a trap. You're going to catch something that eats rocks. We went through the portal. All right. Should we enter the house then? Well, hello. Dead butler. How can we tell that they're dead? Is it just the skin complexion? Douglas Wick, just so you know, I did chortle a bit at your sitcom idea. But I'm playing Tetris again. Are those two ideas in conflict? When you really think about it? All right, so we have stairs. We can go upstairs. We can go through those doors, maybe? There's a lock there, though. There's a key here, and I'm guessing we can't just drag one over to the other. What about this furniture? The furniture is either carved from rock or made from petrified weeds of some sort. Huh. Actually, the end result is rather attractive. Take the furniture. No. You push the furniture around a bit, but hate the end result. So you move it all back again. That's good. Doug says the butt was to explain why I didn't say something sooner and why I'm not saying more in general. Exactly. Doug, I know you're capable of saying things while playing Tetris. You're that far ahead in the game. How may I be of assistance, sir? Typical butler fare here, it looks like. The decaying butler attempts to draw himself up, but the weight of the chain around his waist keeps him slumped over. He doesn't look that slumped over. Who are you? My name is Aramas. I serve Balthazar, the master of the house. His work is very important and cannot be disturbed, so he retains me and a few other servants to handle the domestic work. Well, he's very distinguished. Lexi says, if there's a butler, there must be something for him to bottle. Yeah, I suppose so. Butler? I hardly know anything. 
So his name is Aramas, and there's someone in question named Balthazar. His work is very important. All right. Who else does Balthazar retain to serve him? In addition to myself, Balthazar employs a nanny who cares for the master's young children, and a housekeeper who does the cooking as well. There's a housekeeper? Isn't it kind of dirty around here? I'd say this housekeeper is slacking off. The house is a little dusty, but I'm sure she'll get on the job soon. Hmm, yes. The house is a little dusty, but I'm sure she'll get on the job soon. Who is Balthazar? Balthazar is the personal necromancer to the King of Khan Telest. He's one of the more celebrated sorcerers in the city. Personal necromancer? Lexi says this house is a little dusty, but you know, ashes to ashes, dust to dust. Yes, yes, yes. Um, and the king has a personal necromancer? In this area. What important work is he doing? He does what all necromancers do. He resurrects and sustains the dead so that they can serve the living. But he also spends much of his time researching new magic arts. It's not a very popular activity among other necromancers. In fact, it used to be a crime. But as my master was mentor to most of the others, and because he is a man of power and influence, his research isn't questioned. Not that Balthazar would care in any case. It used to be a crime to learn... Oh, not other magic arts, but new ones? Not exactly sure what he's saying there. What magic arts is he researching? What do I look like? A necromancer? I'm just his personal servant. I don't pry into his work. It could be hazardous to my health. He also mentioned that necromancers resurrect the living, or the, resurrect the dead to serve the living. This really is quite a different culture. Actually, you look like a corpse. I doubt your health could deteriorate much more. There's no need to be rude. An interruption at the wrong time could have disastrous results. His old butler interrupted him once. My first job was to scrape his entrails off the walls. That doesn't sound so good. I'm glad someone called Haplo out for being rude. Yes, exactly. Butlers have uh, a narrow line to walk, you know? Is that why that door is locked? Yes. He takes his breaks at certain times, and only then is it safe to enter. Soon it will be time for his tea. I'm waiting for the housekeeper to bring it. Oh. Enough about your employer. As you wish. So maybe getting into that room, if we indeed need to do that, involves convincing him about the time, rather than getting his key. What's behind that door? That's my master's study, wherein he works his magic and researches the mystic arts. It is off-limits to everyone, including his children, especially his children. The volatile nature of his work makes even the briefest visit potentially fatal. Why do you have a key chained around your waist? This is the key to the study door. My master requires his privacy. I only open the door to give him his meals and when he breaks for tea. Right now, I am waiting for the housekeeper to give me the tea tray. The master will be expecting it soon. He's willing to share quite a lot. Hmm. Don't think he'll do that. Doubt he'll do that. Maybe we could ask him to give him a message when the time comes? When exactly do you expect the housekeeper to bring you the tea? Oh, she should be along any time now. Is there any other way into the study? There is a window, but it's very high off the ground. Too dangerous to enter or exit. 
The master made the study as inaccessible as possible. He doesn't want to be disturbed. Animus voice is quite nice. Yeah, it's a little bit whispery and a little bit gritty, but he wields it well. He's got style. So anyway, there's a window into the study, but it's high off the ground. Is that anything we could use? A good balance of refined and spooky, yes. Perhaps we should talk about something else. As you wish. Why are you standing around? Aren't you dead? Dead? Dead tired, maybe. I don't get enough of rest. Lately, even the act of standing upright has become difficult. I need a vacation. So far, he has not directly acknowledged his death. Where is everyone? Where is who? Whom did you expect to find? I believe you'll find the children upstairs with the nanny and the master hard at work in his study. Could you accompany me? Regrettably, I cannot. I have to serve my previous charge. I must stay here as long as my master desires. What is this place? Well, this is the city of Telestia, one of the oldest and grandest cities in Abarach, aside from the cities in Kar Necros at the world's core. We've lived here for thousands of years, and we're very proud of our accomplishments. Telestia was built by the dwarves for the other mensch races when they were all still alive. The dwarves themselves lived in caves not too far from here. Oh, okay. So Telestia is ancient. And the cities at the world's core are older still. They're millennia old. The dwarves built the city for the other mensch races when they were all still alive. Some of the dwarves' artistry remains throughout the city. For example, the iron statue in the clock tower is ancient. It is the exact likeness of Clytus I, the first in the line of dynasts who have ruled over Abarak. The detail is excellent. Even the royal scepter, still carried by Clytus XIV, is a perfect replica of the original. They say that the statue was made by Clytus I's personal dwarf slave after the dwarf went mad. The madness obviously didn't affect his artistic talent, though. Clytus I, Clytus XIV? And there's a statue that looks like him? No idea who these people are. What happened to the other races? The weaker races died off shortly after they were transplanted to this world. They didn't have strong enough magic to survive the harsh environment of Abarak. They're just gone? Which races? Are you a human? So did dwarves and elves die off? Where exactly did the dwarves live? I believe they once lived in caves just outside of the city. I can't be certain, however, that it isn't simply legend. The region hasn't been explored for a long time. You think this guy is Sartan? I do see the black tips on the hair. That would be interesting. Hmm. And yes, that door with the nine symbols on it did appear to be of dwarven make. Is this scepter anything special? Of course. It is the scepter of rulership. It gives incredible magic power to he who wields it. The original dynast, Clytus I, created the scepter, and his line has used it to secure their leadership ever since. No one would dare oppose a dynast who has control of the scepter. And now we know of a statue that has a perfect replica of it? That's probably going to be useful. Why did Clytus' slave go mad? 
The dwarf was the first experiment in necromancy. Some say that the art wasn't perfected when Clytus I brought his slave back to life, and that insanity was the result. Afterward, Clytus banished the slave back to the ancestral dwarven lair to sit in solitude forever. Holy heck, that's quite a story. So Clytus I, whoever that was, was apparently around at the time of the dawn of necromancy, and his slave who made the first staff was also the first... Ugh. The first subject of an experiment in necromancy that might not have gone perfectly well. Apparently he went insane. This didn't affect the dwarf's devotion to his lord, however. When a body is resurrected, it learns very little, and it usually reverts to doing whatever it did during life. The dwarf continued to worship Clytus I. He even carved the statue in the clock tower to honor him. Few believe that Clytus was deserving of such an honor, but even fewer will admit that in public. Clytus the Fourteenth reveres his ancestor, and no one speaks ill of either of them without fear of being turned to dust. The dwarf carved the statue after his resurrection? Gosh. Okay. Uh, let's keep asking about this city, then we'll ask about the other one. Does the Dynast rule this city? Not really. We've never even seen him. Our king has ruled Telestria for ages. The Dynast only rules here on paper. So there's a Dynast and then there's the king. I wonder where the Dynast is then. Where is Karn Necros? It's at the core of the world. I've never been there. In fact, no one in this Karn has. We've never traveled outside of the city. We've never had to. Enough about this place. As you wish. Why do you have a key chained around your waist? This is the key to the study door. My master requires his privacy. I only open the door to give... We've asked that before. Okay. Perhaps we should talk about something else. As you wish. You're as interesting as a corpse. This conversation is over. As you wish. All right, sir. Uh, well, maybe we can go up the stairs then. Hmm? I'm a little curious, actually. If we go outside... Can we select the window? The house to one side of the town square is small but exquisitely carved from the rock of the cavern. That's so cool. These houses are just carved out of the rock that was already there. The color palette is nice. Uh, I guess it's because lava provides the main light source here. I don't usually like it for that reason. Anyway, no sign of a window. Let's go upstairs. The smallest people made their home in caves and caverns all their own. The cramped nursery holds their a few items, an empty outside. crib, a tiny table, and a rocking chair occupied by an old woman. Point the way. The nanny. Which way, you ask? Where are they found? Just out of sight. We got the tea set. The ground. Don't look too close. They'll run away. The empty stone Unless crib is covered by a thick point. blanket of dust. You keep working on redrawing this the area, dear old emulator. Their home. In caves and caverns all their own. They'll only come outside to play. You listen to her recite the poem, The Little Ones, in its entirety. When she finishes, she starts reading it again from the top. Sorry about that, Lexi. That wouldn't have happened in the original version. The dead nanny ignores you. Her decayed brain, totally engrossed in the task of reading aloud from the children's book. Hey! 
Grandma, over here! They'll only come outside to play. She just continues to read from the book. Point the All way. right. Which way, you ask? Where are they found? Just out of sight under the ground. Well, some of these dead Don't people to seem to obey commands, so let's ask for the book. Give me that book. Maybe if you didn't have your nose in it, you'd notice that I'm trying to speak to you. Unless the arrows point the way. The dead nanny ignores you and continues to read, so you decide to remove the book yourself. You slide the book out of the dead nanny's wrinkled hands. She doesn't resist, but no sooner is the book gone than she stops speaking, her eyes go blank, and she sits motionless. Who are you? I'm the nanny of this family. I take care of the children while the master does his research. In fact, I should be reading to the children right now as they go to sleep. Have you seen my book? Uh, maybe, but I don't think we're talking on the terms of a typical conversation. Why do you read the same rhyme over and over? I read until the children have gone to sleep. I must read now. Where is my book? I can't find my book. This music is maybe one of the most chilling video game compositions I've heard ever heard. Who do you read to? To the children. Aren't they precious? I've taken care of children most of my life. I love to read to them. I should be reading to them now. We can get her to go with us. Let me give you back your book. Please, read from it. I do so love your dulcet tones. The smallest people made their home all right. in caves and caverns all their own. They'll only come outside to play when all the... Well, we have the book. Let's have a look inside of it. We didn't get a transition there. The smallest people made their home in caves and caverns all their own. Not a perfect rhyme, but close enough for the author, I guess. They'll only come outside to play when all the arrows point the way. This sounds like it might be a clue. Which way, you ask, where are they found? Just out of sight under the ground. Don't look too close, they'll run away. Unless the arrows point the way. And that's like a... I don't know what you call it, kind of a rhyme where the syllable is actually identical. Okay. We can turn forward or back, it looks like. I wonder if that means all the arrows just need to point down. The dark place. In the dark, dark place, the monsters wait, their entire race brought on their fate. If the gates fall and they escape, they shan't recall what made them hate. That almost seems like it could be a poem about the patrons. But that would suggest a sergeant author, wouldn't it? Work, work, work. Work, 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 no time for fun. When you're dead, they'll leave you alone. But you'll be back, because work's not done. Work until you're not but bone. That's quite a poem. Glad we got a poetry book to replace our old one. The Day. Yellow night, sky is bright, all the world is filled with light, but just because sun's above, sorry, just because sun's above, every heart is filled with love. This whole book is pretty dark for kids. This one's a little bit more upbeat, yet somehow doesn't really seem to fit with the tone of Abarak. Get that snake. Grab the snake and hold him fast, don't let him go. Grab the snake, or you won't last if you're too slow. Four and one. One makes four, and one left over. The one we've got is just a cave. Started out warm, but got much colder. It's just like living in the grave. Where are the others? 
They disappeared. Perhaps something went very wrong. If they survived, not like we feared, why have they stayed away so long? What could this be? It could be like the Four Realms and the One. One, the original world maybe, makes four realms and one additional realm, which is the labyrinth, just a cave. Started out warm, but got much colder, like the hostile labyrinth, like living in a grave. Where are the others? They disappeared. Perhaps something went very wrong. That almost sounds like a Zifnab sort of perspective, asking where the other Sartan are. Do you think the granny is also Sartan? This is very strange. All right. You leave the book open to the rhyme four and one. So we can leave the book open. Maybe that means the granny will read the other poems if we give her the book back. But I kind of wanted to come with us. Would you accompany me? I know where your book is. You know where my book is? Please take me to it. I must read to the children. They can't go to sleep without their rhymes. They need me, you see. Okay. Dust surrounds the chair, but is absent where the rockers touch the ground. It's as if the chair had been rocking for a long time without ever having changed position. Right. Hello, butler. Haven't figured out the tea thing yet. Don't know where she is. Wait a second. Can we give you the tea set? Aha! You had the tea set to the dead butler. He accepts it gravely and looks over at the double doors. Then he just waits. While he has his tea set, I think now he needs to be convinced of the time. If only there were something we could do here. Look at the tower clock. The clock's circular face has 16 marks around the edge. 16. The single hand, the single hand, points to just before the second mark. All right. The statue wears a crown and holds a scepter. With the haze in the air, you can't discern more from this distance. Perhaps a statue of the first necromancer. This is indeed a chilling, carved place. I suppose, now that we have a granny in tow, we'll figure out what to do next. Next time. <laughs>